coming up, I get connected with the Spectronet interface. I play some games. Chef goes to war on the next. I catch up with Alan and end with a typing. Let's get on then. Episode 100, I got my Spectrum online using the Prism VTX 5000 modem. It was fantastic to get this working, and even better that it was on original 1984 hardware. Getting your Spectrum online in modern times though has changed, slightly, as has the services you can get. Way back in 2014, at a retro event in Manchester, I first saw the Spectronet interface being demonstrated by Dylan Smith, aka Winston. It was an Ethernet interface for your Spectrum. It was linked to a server and two Spectrums could connect, download games and play a multiplayer tank game called Spectank. I was interested in this piece of hardware, but the uses seemed limited at the time. Skip forward to the present day and things have moved on. The interface can be purchased from Byte Delight in various configurations, either a bare board or a boxed version, and I bought this one, the fully boxed version. The services you can access have improved too, as we shall see, but first the hardware. The unit is about the size of a large joystick interface, measuring 10.5cm by 6.5cm by 2.2cm or roughly thereabouts. It has three LEDs on the top and an NMI button. Obviously, there is a network port as well. On the underside there are various jumpers that select which model of Spectrum you are using, plus the ability to disable the unit altogether. With the power off you just plug it in, connect your network cable and power on. You should see a blue screen as the device connects to your network and gets an IP address. Once that is done, the machine will reboot and if this is your first time of turning it on, you will be taken to the site of Byte Delight. You can configure the Spectronet to go to different servers, and there are quite a few online too. These servers run the TNFS protocol, designed specifically for the Spectronet. To do this you enter %fsconfig in BASIC, which will load the setup menu from the Spectronet interface. Here you can configure multiple sites, selecting A to set a new file system, and you type in the name of the desired site. Let's try markround, and here we type in tnfs.markround.com. Now this is a brilliant site. Once you've done that and saved the configuration out, and rebooted the machine, it will boot straight to that site. Here we have several options, but first, just in case you missed it, we are now connected to the internet. Yes, the Spectrum is communicating with the outside world and downloading all of this over the network. Fantastic! The setup for this device was surprisingly easy. Back to the site, and from the main menu, as you can see, there are options to view and download games, demos and utilities, and more. There are useful lists too, like the Hall of Fame, listing popular games, all of which can be downloaded easily by selecting the number, and we can even search by typing in a game name. Once located, you choose which game you want, and yes, we can load it into the Spectrum across the internet, directly into your Spectrum. Now that is cool. A typical 48k game takes about four seconds to load. Let's try Manic Miner then. Yes, no problems at all. To get back to the site you just have to reset your Spectrum. The device can be used on 48k or 128k machines, you just have to set the jumpers as mentioned earlier. You can even create your own server and online services if you want, and the software to do this is free of charge, and this means that you can have your own private store of Spectrum games or create a public facing site. 
Let's have a look at a demo then. There is a large selection as this site uses the Tossack archives, which is practically everything released for the Spectrum. Let's try another site then, into the config, change the site, and how about tnfs.millhill.org? Let's reboot. Now this, as you can see, used to be called ZX Coupo. And yes, it's another great site with lots of games, and a nice selection of Kempston mouse games and utilities. Navigation is different from the first, but works well, and you can type a letter to jump straight to the games that begin with that. For example, pressing C, and you get all the games beginning with C. And now something different to play with. We set the site to zx.tap2.org, load it up, And yes, it's an online specy game. You wander about and try to work out what the hell you're supposed to do. But it's great fun. It's over the internet and it's on your spectrum. By the way, many of these sites have link pages too, so you can jump straight to other sites. And now for something seriously cool. Going to this site, zxnet.co.uk and selecting S will load a terminal program on your spectrum. Using this, you can now access hundreds of standard bulletin board systems, and there's a massive list which can be found on www.telnetbbsguide.com. To get onto these you will need an IP address, and some sites show them. If they don't, you just use the ping command to get the IP address anyway. If there's a part number, which is the number after the colon, you need to make a note of this. Now back to the terminal program, you press A to enter a new IP address, and when asked for a part number you enter that, or press enter for the default. And you should now connect to the BBS. I found this one about Sinclair and had a quick browse around. Wow, this brings back so many memories. The program uses 80 column text, which is sometimes hard to read, but come on, your spectrum is talking to a bulletin board system and many more all over the world. There are masses of them, but be careful, you never know what you might find. Some also ask for escape keys to be pressed to let you in, and I have no idea how to send that via the Spectronet. Also be prepared to visit lots of systems that, well, just don't work or are half built. Some though are interesting to browse, and you can even find some with online multi-user games. Sat there playing an online mud was great, sadly I just didn't have that much time on my hands. Spectronet interface opens up a whole world to explore. Not only Spectrum TNFS sites, but hundreds of normal bulletin board systems that cater for hundreds of interests. I found BBS systems for Amigas, Atari, Apple, Commodore, and a whole host more. There are a few 8-bit ones, and things that are named strangely, but well worth a try anyway. This is a fantastic add-on for any Spectrum. It's just a good job that it works over the internet, Otherwise, my phone bill will be massive. Definitely recommended then. This is Pro Skateboard Simulator, released by Codemasters in 1989. 
This game came in two flavours, the 48k version and the 1 to 8k version, with, according to the inlay, an extended mix soundtrack. So let's play that one then. Oh god, copy protection, great. Once you get past this by picking a number in a certain square, the game begins and we get the promised music. The game has several sections and the first has you collecting flags. The graphics are nice, they're well defined and move smoothly, but the game is very unforgiving, bordering on frustration. The time limit is so tight and the smallest mistake does not slow you down in the real world, oh no, you can explode. You just vanish and are placed back on the track within an area of the terrible incident. The control is wrong for this style of game, I think at least. You rotate left and right and you push up to gain speed and you push down to flip 180 degrees. You can also do bunny hops by pressing fire, and this comes into use in later levels. This awkward control often means you crash way too often and the timer just runs out. It took me ages to complete this first level, and I must have exploded so many times. On the second level, finally, and oh no, a typical Codemasters dodging game, very similar to their driving games like Super Stuntman. Here the course scrolls vertically, and you move left and right, and you can speed up or slow down. However, you have added inertia, and so you can go flying off into a tree very easily. As well as the trees, there are rivers and bridges to avoid, and you have to move through the gates that look like triangle things on each level. Again, here the time limit is bordering on frustration. This could be anything really, you just have to change the main sprite and you could have badger racing for example, or monkey running. There's nothing really that links it to skateboarding. Now I had a skateboard in the 80s and they weren't built for cross country use. They're just not designed to work on grass. If you complete this, and it did take me a long long time, you go back to the 3D Marble Madness style level, with added jumps, and this again was so frustrating. This flip between 3D and top-down racing continues throughout the game, with things getting just that little bit harder each time. The top-down element seems a bit of an afterthought, when the main game, which, apart from the time limit, is very similar to Marble Madness as mentioned before, and it isn't a bad idea really. They could have extended this part, with longer levels, other things to avoid, rather than trying to bolt some vertical game onto it as well. Needless to say, I'm not a fan of this. This is Chucky Egg 2, released by ANF Software in 1985. Following on from the Chucky Egg review in episode 105 comes Chucky Egg 2. Henhouse Harry has been called in to help a chocolate egg manufacturer and their automated plant that has gone crazy. And Harry needs to collect all the ingredients and also all of the toys that go inside. So this really appears to be a kinder egg factory, however no mention of that name can be found in the game. I wonder if they asked for a license and didn't get it. Anyway, on to the game then. Gone is a classic single screen progression platformer of the first game, and now we have a sort of Jet Set Willy like game with Henhouse Harry having to navigate the game map. The first challenge is to get past the guard dog, and to do this you have to go underground and grab the bone. This section is a bit slow, and but does guide you into the mechanics of what's needed later on in the game. Once you drop the bone, you can get into the game properly, and get into the factory. first screen introduces another mechanic, ropes and rope jumping. Now this I remember being very tricky when I first got it in 1985, and it still is. Onward finally, and into single visit rooms. These are rooms that you can only navigate in one direction and you can't go back. At this point the game feels fairly lacking, there's no excitement, and there's nothing that entices you in further. 
Next we come to yet another mechanic, a moving staircase. So timing here is very important, otherwise you'll end up back down at the bottom again. The room designs are a bit plain really. Some are challenging, others simple, but it does take ages to get through them. The graphics are average, and there are some nicely animated sprites like the giant hand, and then you get things like rats that are a bit bland. The sound consists of just clicks for walking and jumping, and a nice little tune when you die. Most of the screens involve collecting things, so the whole premise is you have to wander around the game map, collect items to make the eggs, and then drop them in certain rooms that are very well signposted. There are 120 rooms to visit, and it can take a long time to complete this game. In fact, the RZX playback is over 6 hours long. Luckily, there's a save game facility though. I was not good enough to even get one of the items to a drop point, so from this point on, we'll be looking at the RZX playback. Once you have an object, you take it to the designated drop point and drop it in, and once you've dropped enough in, you are told that it is full, and you now go in search of another object, or another ingredient. The first one is milk, and then you go on to things like cocoa and sugar later on. Collecting toy pieces acts like ingredients, in that you have to take them back to a toy making machine, and when you've collected them all, a toy appears. And this is why the game takes so long to complete. Once you have all the ingredients and all of the toys, an egg will be created. And to complete the level, or to complete the game as you think, you have to take it back to the very start, all the way back to your truck. This is not the end of the game, however. Oh no, it all starts again with another egg to make, and more enemies to avoid. The jump mechanism is frustrating, and you often find yourselves plummeting to your death, because you got it wrong and bounced off a wall. The wall bounce is to be found on many screens, and can be a real pain, very frustrating, and it takes a long time to get it right. I have mixed feelings about this game. I loved the first one, and I was hoping that this would be more of the same. I like some elements of it, like collecting various pieces and taking them back to a certain screen, but on the flip side it's so frustrating to play, and one small mistake means losing a life. This is Hell Yeah, released in 2020 by Andy Precious. Your brother has vanished into a hellish void, and creatures are now appearing from it. Luckily, you are part of an elite special team, so you are well equipped to rescue him. This is a run and gun game with some great graphics that are designed really well to hide colour clash. You can pick up power-ups, health and shields along the way, and the enemies never stop. This is similar in concept to Ghouls and Ghosts, or Ghosts and Goblins, and there are certain platform elements in there too. The main character is sometimes tricky to control, but you get a decent amount of hits before you die, although I did die a lot. Sound consists of some spot effects that suit the game well. There are various mini-bosses to defeat before you can move on, and the whole game is great fun to play, especially if you are good at this style of game. Once you get used to the controls, you'll really enjoy this, and it's definitely recommended. Hello, today we're going to take a look at another Spectrum Next game, The Next War. The Next War is a tower defence strategy game, and I must admit, I really do like a good tower defence game. It was written by Lamporos Potamianos. For anyone who doesn't know what a tower defence game is, 
In essence, you have a road or a route which your enemies take and you have to place towers which have various powers that can shoot the enemies or delay them and stop them from getting to the end of the road. I'm not quite sure of the history of tower defence games. They seem to start popping up around 15 years ago on various formats, almost always homebrew. They're really good. They're very addictive and real-time sinks, and The Next War is a really good example of that. I played a game earlier, and I just thought I'd have a quick one to remind myself of the game before recording this section, and I ended up playing it for over an hour. In keeping with many tower defence games, there are two general types of enemies. Ground enemies and flying enemies. Your towers are effective in different measures against these enemies. Some towers can only shoot ground enemies, some towers can only shoot flying enemies, and some towers can shoot both. The next war has all kinds of towers. The blue towers, which can shoot ground enemies. Green towers, which can shoot air enemies. Magenta towers, which can shoot both, but shoot at a reduced speed, but do pack quite a punch. And yellow towers, which will slow down enemies, either ground enemies or air enemies. Now, the enemies themselves come in various different types. And there's basically two things you can change on their enemies. Either their speed, or how difficult it is to kill them. Air enemies don't follow the path, they just have to traverse the screen. If an enemy successfully completes its path, then you lose a life. You start the next war with nine lives. Enemies come in waves, and every time you kill an enemy, you're given more cash and your towers cost cash. One of the things I always find with these games is that if you miss a few enemies and lose a few lives early on, you've got less resources for the waves coming up. The first thing I'd say about this game is that it looks really, really good. It clearly uses the tile map and sprites, so it uses the full screen of the spectrum. It's not limited to the middle portion. The borders have been used for the entire screen. There are three difficulty levels. I nearly always play on normal. In fact, I only think I've ever really played on normal. And getting to know these levels and getting to know which waves come when is key to this. You don't want to have used all your money up on ground-only towers and then find that you've got a load of flying air enemies coming across your screen, none of which you can kill. This game has a terrific intro screen as well, a little menu screen where you can select mouse control and on that screen there is a really good rocking tune playing. If I'm going to criticise this game, it's that I found it really difficult to get working on C-Spec. I could only get it working on C-Spec version 2.12.36, and that was loading the game directly into the emulator from the command line, not putting it onto an SD card image. That's only a small criticism, though. The other thing that I did find is that the title screen tune doesn't play on C-Spec for some reason. The in-game sound effects do play. The in-game sound effects are pretty good. There's sound effects for selecting and deploying towers, a shooting noise, a noise for when you hit an enemy, and a noise for when an enemy is destroyed. This is another homebrew next game that I would highly recommend. This one is free if you choose not to pay for it. This is one of those at name your price games. I think it's well worth a few pounds. It's digital download only, but that doesn't really detract from the game. As I say, the only problem is that it is a little tricky to get working in C-Spec. So that's the next war. A tower defence game for the Spectrum Next. Great if you've got a mouse for your Next as well and looking for games to use it. Until next time, happy gaming. Thank you.
There's a guy called Richard Hallas who's very well known in the in the sort of manic minor modding community, and he's he he was able to kind of point me in the right direction with a few bits and pieces here. And this doesn't feel right. This should be here, and so on and so on. There are there are some differences in the game. Um, I was going to say, the, is, is, there, is there anything that's in the Vic game as in a mechanic, like a crumbling stair or whatever, that, that isn't on the on the spectrum oh, yeah, isn't in the Manic Miner engine? Yeah, there's quite a few things. I mean, for a start, there are four conveyor belts in each, potentially four conveyor belts in each room. So obviously that had to be redone. Additionally, there is there's a mechanic where, as you know, in the in the original Manic Miner, if he hits his head on a wall, he just falls, he breaks, mm. he breaks the jump. Whereas in the Vic version, if he hits his head on the wall, he keeps going. Obviously, he doesn't go into the wall, but he keeps going on his jump. So he does a sort of lower jump, if yeah. you like. And that's include that's in that's in a, a few parts of the game where, if you use the original game engine mechanic for jumping, it would just be impossible. So there were a few there were a few bits and pieces here and there where it was just like there's no way that that you could complete the level with the regular engine. So. I patched a few things in to make that work. I think I had to make his jump very slightly longer. Is that, is that because of the, the screen ratio and the screen size? Or? Well, no. I mean, it's the the thing is the Vic Twenty's resolution a bit smaller than the than the Spectrums, but essentially the game size on the Spectrum is this is a is a one for one pixel for pixel match to the Vic Twenty. Um, right. The only difference being that the Vic Twenty one is stretched. Right, whereas, okay. whereas this one, we it, it's it's compressed into about seventy percent of the screen. That's why you've got that perils of Willy logo mm. on the yeah. on the, on the side there. Were you tempted to improve it by you know creating more frames of animation or um, adding adding more color or variations of color to platforms, or did, did you just want to make it as close as you could? The thing is, the I don't know if you've seen the the graphics of the, of the Vic one, but. They, they've, they've got the same sort of minor willy sprite, but then they've got these poorly animated cheap... I'm not, I don't want to be too harsh on games like this because they weren't able to use the same tools that we have today. And at the no. same time, you know that they, the, the programmers were under pressure to bring a game out quickly and, and so mm, on. So, yeah. you know, there are various reasons. It is what it is. It's important to say, if I'm, if I'm critical of the graphics, I'm not being critical of the people that created them. I figured, well, let's let's do something that that would look more sort of Matthew Smith esque, let's say, right? Yep. You know, at least. And so I attempted to do that. I'm not saying I completely succeeded, but yeah, the animation of on the Spectrum version is more akin to what you might find on Manic Mine or Jet Set Willy. So there are more frames, but I didn't yep. go crazy. You know, I kept them fairly all right. And again, I consulted with the uh, with the high priests of. <laughs> The manic minor community to, to make sure that I wasn't that I wasn't committing any great sort of blasphemous acts. Well, when I when I played it, I obviously uh, I did a review of it and I played the Vic version first and then I played the Spectrum version. Mm. I think the Spectrum version is slightly harder. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, it's it's faster for sure. You know, mm. it, it runs at sort of manic minor speed. All I can say is that as much as possible, I kept it um, within the manic minor engine, the same mechanics. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted people to play it and feel like, oh, this is like a Manic Miner game. It's exactly like you would expect if this game had come out in 1984, you know. So if, if there was anything that you could have done better on that game, did you have anything that you wish you could have done, like extend it by another 10 rooms or add something else? Was it? Well, we did talk about that. You know, I, I thought about the idea of maybe we could sort of open it up to the community because there was this there is space for for probably another 10 rooms in the end i added only um one extra room because in the advertising for the game it said that there were 33 screens and there isn't there's only 32 <laughs> so i thought well that's a good reason for adding another screen you know for for, for fun so there is there is one extra right. screen and i also added a, a sort of end of level thing as well but i think those are in the bone there's a bonus there's a bonus version for people that, that that donated when they downloaded the thing is you when you're recreating something you know you don't want to add too much because it's uh it's already what it is already what it is no. mostly leave it well, as it was I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have enjoyed it myself included so we're looking forward to that to the next game whatever that may be mm.
Yes, we're back in typing corner for a bit. Whilst browsing this magazine, Computer Choice from February 1984, I came across these type-ins, none of which can be found on the internet. They are all sound routines that produce sound effects for the spectrum, so after a few minutes of typing, let's hear what they sound like. Let's start with the first one. And now the second. And the third. Fourth. And the fifth. And the last one. As you can see, the listings are quite small and could easily be added to your own games if you wanted them. There was another one, but that just played the Death March, and I'll spare you that. Because they're not available anywhere else, I've added the tape file containing all of these listings to my website, along with the other type-ins from the show. Enjoy!